Hi, in the previous video I did a teardown of the Fluke 77.4 and compared it with the B Bryman BM786 uh, meter and I noticed something really interesting in this. So in a minute I'm going to show you how to turn an average responding Fluke 77.4 into a true RMS Fluke uh, 177 and do it for about oh, 10 cents. Stick around. But um, curiously here on the website I didn't actually know but I think Fluke have technically discontinued the 70 series. The venerable 70 series. I think it's actually been discontinued because if you go to their digital multimeter page here, there is no Fluke 70 series anymore. They've got the 170 series. They've got 175, 177 and 179, but that's it. There is no 77. Um, like it's still there on the site if you actually search for it. But I think, um, as I talked about in the video previous to that about um, why flukes are so expensive in that, um, yeah, this is appealing to legacy customers only because the Fluke 70 series were average responding meters. They were not true RMS meters. So a slight bit of history here. Um, the Fluke 79 series three, that actually was true RMS, but they don't sell the 79 anymore. That was replaced by the uh, 179 or the 170 series. In fact, the entire 70 series has been replaced by the 170 series true RMS but there are customers who still want average responding meters instead of true RMS as I said they have these built uh, the readings for these average responding meters built into uh, test procedures in the military and government and organization they don't want to change all their test procedures they want an average responding meter so fluke will still sell you one but basically nobody buys the 70 series anymore you buy the 170 series so you buy the 177 and it's exactly the same meter as <laughs> the 77.4, except it's true RMS. Now, when they actually moved over to the 170 series, this was about 2001, and they dropped the, uh, you know, the slash, like the Mark IV and everything from it. And so the 177 you buy today is still the same 177 from 2001. So it's a 20 year old model now. There is no 177 Mark II or whatever. It's still the 177. So 20 year old model now, but they kept selling these uh, 70 series. They The Mark III was the first series fluke that actually looked like this with the new overmolded design. And that's what uh, the 170 series stemmed from. And then when they moved to the Mark IV, the only one you could get was the 77 Mark IV. They just didn't bother with the previous versions because they knew they were phasing it out. They wanted to go to push everyone to the 170 series true RMS, but they kept one model in the 70 line as an average responding. But I think it's gone because like it's just not on their main page. Wow. Anyway, I actually forget how long these, like the 170 series has been around for 20 years now. That is absolutely incredible. Anyway, during the teardown video of the 77.4, I noticed something interesting in the chips here. And uh, this is my um, high-res photo available on my Flickr account. I put all my high-res photos on my Flickr account. Go check that out. Anyway, um, if you want to know how I get these excellent uh, PCB uh, photos, uh, head on over. It's actually on my second channel. I did a part three to my PCB uh, photography light box, and this is how I get the excellent photos. So I tell you how to make one in there. Anyway, um, yeah, I noticed something really interesting. We've got our MSP430 processor over here. We've got a 20-bit uh, Delta Sigma uh, converter in here. The reference is in there somewhere. We've got the Fluke multimeter chips, which, by the way, if you search the number here, you can actually still find, and you can actually, it looks like you can buy this chip from third-party um, vendors. Ab absolutely amazing. Anyway, the interesting thing is up here. This is an AD737. That's a true RMS converter chip used in like a ton of multimeters on the market. What's it doing in a Fluke 77 that is an average responding meter? Why does it have the chip there? Now, as I noted in my teardown video, the PCB actually is the Fluke 170 series. There it is, Fluke 170X up there. Um, it's exactly the same PCB. And sure enough, I just uh, looked for some uh, teardown photos, found them on the EV blog forum. Everything's on the EV blog forum. Um, and sure enough, the 170 and the 79 have the exact same components, except one. And sure enough, the AD737, it's a true RMS to DC converter used in multimeters. So 
what gives? Why would they go to the expense to put this chip in an average responding meter? Well, consistency in build is one thing. Of course, Fluke make a, a quite a decent margin on these things, so maybe the cost of a 737 is not a big deal. They just have the same build. But remember when I said there is actually one component build difference between the 77 and the 177. This is where you go to the features over here. Look at this. Computes. True RMS average rectified value and absolute value it's actually got three different modes this chip it can actually do average responding multimedia functionality itself of course most average responding meters on the market the real cheap ones they do this inside the multimeter chipset itself but the fluke chipset obviously doesn't do that in fact we can have a look at the block diagram in a minute but what they're doing in the 77 and other model flukes as we'll look at um, they're actually using this RMS converter chip in the average response responding mode. So I won't go into huge detail on how this works. I'll link it in the data sheet down below if you want to have a read for yourself. But basically, so what we've got here, this is our input uh, signal here, and this is our input uh, FET a buffer, and that goes into effectively what is a full wave bridge rectifier, and that gives you an absolute value. It takes any negative stuff and puts it and flips the negative half up uh, to the positive half. And then that um, goes into, then there's an RMS core down here and that's what does the true RMS uh, conversion part using an averaging capacitor down here and then up here you can choose either AC or DC uh, feedback path here so if you bypass this RMS circuit down here then you'll get a DC average response just like any DC average responding meter and of course, you should know your peak to RMS uh, conversion factors. And of course, uh, uh, RMS is 0 0.707 and uh, your average is 0 0.636. That's the DC um, average of the peak value. So what they do is they calculate a scale factor in here of, in this case, 1.11, which is 0 0.707 divided by 636. Of course, all it does is basically it squares the signal, it takes the average, and then contains the square root, RMS, root mean squared. And any RMS uh, converter will have a maximum crest factor it can actually uh, tolerate. And, you know, like a pulse, uh, like a very narrow pulse down here, like an extreme crest factor. And your true RMS multimeter probably can't handle uh, that sort of thing. But anyway, um, you can actually get errors. But what happens in your side, your multimeter, if you've got an average responding meter, they it's actually calibrated to match the average, to give you an average responding for a perfect sine wave. So here it is, undistorted sine wave. So perfect sine wave, if you've got a true RMS meter, it gives you 0 0.707 of uh, the peak value, and an average responding meter will also give you 0 0.707. There's no error whatsoever, and they give you the error over here, zero. But you put in any other waveform, a square wave, a triangle wave, noise, rectal, a pulse wave, a, you know, SCR switching waveform, which is like a switching um, uh, thing, then uh, no, it's not a sine wave, so you're going to get an error on your average responding meter. And that can be some of these errors can be pretty high right you know it's it's not a huge amount if you're talking about say a triangle wave or something like that like 3.8 percent it's not much but the further away it gets from that ideal sine wave eh, the more error you're going to get this is why people use true rms meters and they're pretty much the standard these days except on really low cost meters because most multimeters that need true rms function they have to spend more in their bill of materials to get this AD737 chip, but Fluke, because their meters are so high price and they design it in, it, they're just using the chip anyway and they're using it in average mode. So how do you do that? Well, it's real simple. You simply remove the averaging capacitor. And if you do that, it basically passes straight through and you get the average mode. So surprise, surprise, what do we find in our average responding Fluke 77? Yep. A capacitor right there, missing <laughs> the 33 microfarad capacitor. And that is the only difference between a Fluke 77 and a Fluke 170 series. But it's not the only meter that does this. Check out the Fluke 87. We've actually got the service manual here, and um, I'll link it in down below. And we've got the full schematics. Check this out. Whoa, beautiful. Back when you could get schematics. I cannot find a Fluke 77 um, schematic or a 170 uh, series schematic, but it's going to be very similar to this. 
And there's that Fluke Custom ASIC I showed you before. And um, yeah, I think you can actually buy this um, on the market. So yeah, yeah, I don't know if you can buy it from Fluke, but other suppliers have it by the looks of it. Now, the good thing about this schematic is that they tell you, look, uh, for the Model 87 only, they do this. This is, um, it looks like that's doing uh, locate near the V terminal. They are using that as a temperature um, sensor. Yeah, yeah, thermal uh, compensation there. And there's an 800 hertz filter here, which is specific to the Model 87 only. And uh, then Model 83 only here. But bingo, same thing happens here. There is your averaging capacitor on your AD737, Model 87 only, 33 microfarads. So that's what's missing from our Fluke 77 to turn it into a Fluke 177. And I haven't checked, but I'm willing to bet this is also the same on the Fluke 27 Series 2 as well, because that's an average responding version of the Fluke 28. I bet you they're doing exactly the same thing, a missing capacitor, that's it. They're designed for different markets. All right, let's do a test before we do modification here. I've got three different meters, the True RMS Fluke 87.5, the 77.4 we're going to modify, and the uh, 17B here. And both of these are average responding meters. They are calibrated for an average response of a sine wave. So these should read the same. They might have different like upper frequency limits and stuff, but at a reasonable frequency, I'm going to use uh, 88 hertz here. Why not? So that is well within... Um, the specifications of these meters. So I'm feeding in a one volt RMS sine wave here into all three of them in parallel. As you can see, they all read identically. 17B is a bit lower because this is not a very super duper accurate meter. And these are within uh, one least significant uh, digit count. So that's for a sine wave. And that's what, even though these are average responding meters, and we are not going to get an average response of the sine wave of zero because that's a mathematical average the how the averaging response in these works is we saw before the full wave bridge rectifier and then it's calibrated um, to give you the, the average result based on a sine wave but what happens when you don't use a sine wave? Well, we have the handy table here from uh, the data sheet. You can actually um, calculate these yourself. So for an undistorted or uh, perfect sine wave here, um, we should, of course, get exactly the same value. There's 0% error between an RMS meter and an average responding meter because these are calibrated for a sine wave. So you get 0% error. But if we change this to a symmetrical square wave, i.e. 50-50 uh, duty cycle square wave, then we should get an error of plus 11 percent and sine to square it should stay at one volt rms this remains the same bingo there's our 11 percent error very close to it so a triangle wave we're looking at a minus 3.8 percent error so it should be negative uh yep that's about a, a negative uh 3.8 percent error is it not now a lot of people actually make the mistake of thinking that a perfect sine wave actually has a crest factor of one now of course the crest factor is uh the peak value divided by the rms value the biggest the peak to rms value um is of course 1.414 you should know that for your uh, peak to rms conversions only a square wave actually has a perfect crest factor um, a good data sheet for a meter will actually have and specify the maximum uh, crest factor for its uh, uh, true RMS measurement chip. Let's play around with some other waveforms here. Let's do a uh, PRBS, which is a pseudo uh, random. Yeah, we're not going to bother to calculate it, but both are reading the same and it's reading highs. So we'll see what that measures after the modification. And I've got a pulse here, which is uh, set to one millisecond uh, pulse time. And as you can see, even the Fluke 87.5 can't handle that horrible uh, crest factor there. So it's 0.565, but the average responding meters are even worse. But it'll be interesting to see after modification if this goes up to match the true RMS meter. So let's solder in the capacitor onto the handy pad which we have down here. It's even marked fantastically this positive on this side. Got my AVX Tantalum sample kit. Very handy. Um, now the Fluke 87.5 schematic uh, and parts list says it's a uh, 33 mic, same as the um, analog devices data sheet. It says it's a 16 volt, 300 milliohms. The best I've got down here that's not a biggie um, is this 33 mic. That's a uh, B case and that's only 10 volts. But considering that this is a nine volt battery, it'll be good enough for Australia, I think. So I don't know what the ESR of this is. I don't think it's gonna matter. So let's use one of those. 
All right, let's get some freshy on there, shall we? I think that's uh, that could be an A, but anyway, got the polarity correct there. No whackers, she'll be right. Because tantalums, unlike electrolytic capacitors, they have the mark up there for the anode, um, not the cathode, so the positive. Whereas electrolytic caps um, uh, have it have the black mark on the uh, on the negative. So that's rather annoying, but there we go. No whackers. All right, we have our brand new Fluke 177 meter here. However, now that I think about it, um, before I cross my fingers and power this up, I don't think we're going to get away with this without recalibrating this meter. Because um, even though it's calibrated with a sine wave, the internal scale factor of the conversion is going to be different. So I reckon we're going to end up with um, the scale factor of uh, for the RMF 0.7, which is uh, 0 0.707, divided by the yeah divided by the uh, DC um, average, which is uh, 0 0.636. So I reckon we're going to end up with an error of 1.1. Have I got that in the right direction? I think so. I think we're going to be. It should read up by. 11%. Um, yeah, same as it does with a square wave, isn't it? So, let's power this sucker on. Of course it's going to work. It doesn't say 177. That'd be nice. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we can mod the firmware, something like that. Anyway, and if you mod the firmware, by the way, we could turn this into a 179 by adding temperature measurement, because I think it's all in there, but yeah, it's just the firmware you pay extra for. Anyway, um, yeah, let's plug it in. Here we go. I've got my leads. Bingo! <laughs> 1.11. <laughs> so yeah, um, before I just measure the other stuff, I'll go to the uh, calibration uh, manual and uh, we'll have to um, enter the cal mode on the back and uh, we'll have to recalibrate. Now to do this, you've got to switch it to millivolts over here and then you got to probe in the back side. Oh, yep, there we go, got it. Ta-da, we're in. Now unfortunately, the steps we want are the AC volt steps here, six and seven, and also, of course, um, amps as well. So you've got uh, AC down here for the 400 milliamps and the six amp range as well. Now, I'm hoping that we can actually bypass these other steps because I don't want to have to actually calibrate all the other ranges. I just want to be able to calibrate that one. Um, yeah, I'm going to see if I can, like, bypass this and only calibrate the ranges we want. I bet you Murphy says we can't do that. Yeah, okay, right, so this l reads the live reading on the input, it's uncalibrated, okay? So press and hold this button to display the required input, min max, so there you go, so it's telling us we have to feed in 600 millivolts DC, great. But it says press the yellow button, stall the calibration, advance to the next step, this button is also used to exit calibration mode, can we just like think I'm going to be forced to actually calibrate this entire meter, damn it. Now, I've got nothing plugged into it, and if I press that to go to the next one, it just double beeps at me. So it's smart enough to know, no, you idiot, um, you haven't got anything plugged in. And if I maybe try and hold that down, does that do anything? Nope. Does range do anything? Nope. Oh, nah, nah, I'm, I'm forced into it. I don't know, backlight? <laughs> the backlight still independently works. Um, no, no, I'm forced to calibrate this whole damn thing. Damn it. So anyway, lucky I have my uh, calibrators over here, AC and DC, and well, I've got various Ohmsky things, and uh, like, you know, this is not a high-spec meter, and of course I can compare it against my uh, seven and a half digit uh, jobbies over here. The bar graph actually still works. It does the business, so there you go. So I'm feeding in 600 millivolts. Um, that's what we have to feed in, and that's what we're live reading uh, at the moment, but of course it's uncalibrated. Um, it says it goes into uncalibrated mode, when it shows you that live reading, but we know we're feeding in uh, the precise value. In fact, well, there it is over on there. <laughs> That's good enough for Australia, definitely. So I whack that in and boom, we go to step two. Ugh. Anyway, I'm up to the 60 volt step and uh, well, that only goes up to 10 volts. So yeah, I'm going to have to use some of my other standards over here. 
high voltage uh, supply. So I'm up to step six. I switched over to my AC volts uh, standard here and I can generate both required 600 millivolts at 60 hertz and also 600 volts at 60 hertz. And not everyone, unfortunately, is going to have um, this bit of kit. And likewise here we have 660 volts live, but I'm feeding in 600. So I'm going to calibrate that sucker and we're up to Omsky. Well, dumbass Dave tried to cheat, didn't he? And I exited that cow procedure thinking it would have stored all those previous steps in the E squared prom and Bob's your uncle, right? I wouldn't have to, I could just like get a quick result just to show that it worked and I could do the current range later. Um, it, yeah, nah. <laughs> oh, winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> I got it. Um, it was not easy getting uh, the AC current source, uh, particularly the 6 amp AC uh, at 60 hertz current source, but I was able to uh, cobble it together here in the lab and I got it. Um, and here it is. It's our true RMS. There you go. One volt RMS. Um, it's recalibrated. You see how it was off before. It's now recalibrated. So now we can fiddle around to see if it matches this. So let's go waveform, let's go our square wave. Oh, look at that. Like I bought one, like I bought one. True RMS, none of that average responding rubbish. Ramp, look at that. It was matching this before, now it's matching this. Oh, Bobby Dazzler. That triangle wave we are getting before. How about that pseudo random binary sequence we got before? That's not, I'm, I'm still gonna call that. I mean, this might have a different response to this perhaps, but it's certainly not um, higher like we were getting before, so that's all right. There we go, I've got an exponential rise function there. Um, they're just the first <laughs> ARB one that uh, came off the rank, and um, yep, sure enough, there's that one millisecond pulse we had before. That's not too shabby. So there you go, I, I did it. I converted a Fluke 77 Series 4 into a Fluke 177. I don't think there's any other differences really. I think it's just that the 170, all of the 170 series, every model is uh, true RMS, whereas the original 70 series was um, average responding, but it has the true RMS capable chip in it. Don't recommend doing this at home unless you have the ability to calibrate all those ranges. So if you know of a way to skip, those steps in there because that's annoying because sometimes you might just have like one range that's out and you just want to fix that one range in this case that would have been really nice that being said it's not easy to get uh six amps 50 hertz you know you have to like bodge something with a uh transformer and a you know big variable resistor load or something like that um which is basically how i got it i used my um <laughs> variable frequency um ac and it it was four amps maximum um on the nameplate but i managed to get six amps out of it and i just uh, put it into a two ohm load and i just adjusted the output voltage until i um got the you know near enough and it measured on the seven and a half digit meter and bob's your uncle i was able to get it but yeah you've got to complete every single step and then it says end uh on the end of it and then you press the yellow button and then it's boop it goes back to normal and it doesn't so you can't just go halfway through or do an individual step if you know how i'll leave it in the comments and you should be able to do that i think with the uh 80 series and probably the uh 20 series as well the 27 28 so yeah if you do know uh, let us know in the comments down below but i hope you found that interesting and useful if you did please give it a big a thumbs up as always comment down below catch you next time